Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dyslexia Life Hacks Show. I'm your host, Matthew Head, and in this episode, I'm talking to Dr. Martin Bloomfield. He's the founder of Dyslexia Bites, a place to show the international and intercultural perspective on dyslexia. He also works with York Associates, where he provides training on dyslexia awareness and special education needs. And around all that, he somehow manages to fit in lectures on ethics as well. As always, I'll put links to Dyslexia Bikes, York's associate, as well as other things we talk about in the show notes, which will be available at dyslexialifehacks.com forward slash podcast. Welcome to the show, Martin. Thanks for inviting me on. Oh, accepting me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. But, <laughs> yeah, Martin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he dropped me a very amusing message on LinkedIn and was like, well, can I come on your podcast? And if not, do we have to awkwardly ignore each other at Dyslexia Show next time we're in the same place? <laughs> so that's kind of where I want to start, actually, is that I sat and watched your talk with uh, Rachel Morgan Triver, who's been a previous guest on this podcast about dyslexia and autism working together at the Dyslexia Show 2023. Now, was that your kind of first deal in seeing how two neurodiversities work together? And what sort of thing did you learn from, off the back of that? Well, it's my first time um, working in how dyslexia and autism work together. It's not my first time working in m- working with multiple neurodiversities. Mm. Um, and in fact, I don't think it's anybody's first time working with multiple neurodiversities. It's just often we just don't realize it. We don't know it. Yes. Uh, the more you come to learn about neurodiversities and different neurodivergent conditions, the more you start to recognize, okay, there's some autism here, there's some ADHD there, there's some dyslexia here. I mean, personally, I, I, I'm... I, I'm full of wonderful co-occurrences. I don't like that word comorbidity. It sounds really morbid. Morbidity. So, yeah, yeah, I don't think comorbidity would be the correct word. Co-occurrence <laughs> does sound better. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm dyslexic and I'm dyspraxic. Ah, uh, uh, yes. I've never yes. been given a formal diagnosis for ADHD, but everybody who knows me swears that I am. And and I I, I understand the manifestations of ADHD and I can see that. But I've just never been given a formal diagnosis, so I don't like introducing myself as that. Yes, yeah, that's interesting because I've seen your, should we say, presenter persona, which may or may not be the same as your real persona, and it's very high energy, which I guess would be a kind of example of ADHD on the go side, so to speak. Ever since I was a teenager, people have been, on, and even now, I mean, now with a, a, an old man, even now <laughs> people are asking me what drugs I'm on. <laughs> they, can't, oh, right. <laughs> they can't quite keep up most of the time. Uh, how, how flattering. What drugs yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just, uh, just, uh, yeah, yeah, coke and alcohol. Coke yeah. as in Coca Cola. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that was it's the wrong after, soft drink. After you, after you give a presentation or, or something, and people's comments are, I can't believe how much energy you have. You think you commented that the presentation was good. <laughs> it's definitely sort of a backhanded way of saying I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> the thing with high energy talks is always engaging, isn't it? Like a bit of movement around, a bit of examples, physical stuff. And I remember the talk that I watched to yours, you're moving around the room and chucking things out to people. And you know. I had a Rachel, the, the the lady I did the neurodiversity talk with at the dyslexia show, she did a TED talk, and I'm not certain I could physically do a TED talk. They'd have to, <laughs> they'd have to nail me down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you got that. You got that spotlight on you, haven't you? And you can't <laughs> exit the ring. <laughs> You're like, I, I'm in the dark. Here, come back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe you have to get super sticky shoes out that day. <laughs> so, but you were mentioned as a teenager being high energy. Now, where did your kind of dyslexia awareness start? Was that around about a teenager or did you notice no, that later on in life? No, my dyslexia awareness began um, when I was 30, when I was given my first older diagnosis, because I've been given two. And each, oh, diag- okay. each diagnostic assessment came out with the same results, which is, which is- interesting. Because there were different types of diagnostic assessment. One was a, um, oh, okay. an educational psycho. So it's not only one type of person that gives a dyslexia diagnostic assessment. Mm, mm. So one was an educational psychologist and the other was the other type of person or, or the other major type of person. I yes. can't remember off the top of my head. Oh, God, and I've interviewed them, but I can't think of the name. Um, I'll drop it in the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they both came out as, as dyslexic. Educational very, assessor. Thank you very much. Yes, they both came out as dyslexic, dyspraxic. Neither of them mentioned dyscraphia or dyscalculia. And okay. I'm, I'm always interested in my potential dyscalculia. I'm also interested in what type of dyslexia I have. 
So the more okay. I read about things like surface dyslexia, the more I suspect surface dyslexia. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, so this type of dyslexia thing is sort of a concept that's relatively new to me. Somebody mentioned it in a previous episode about having surface dyslexia, and I'm like, yeah. Can you- surface dyslexia is, I mean, to, to give it a very, very simplistic description, essentially much of dyslexia is about phonological processing deficit. Mm. People with surface dyslexia don't have phonological processing deficit. It's more like phonological processing surface, almost. But once we get beyond, um, so for instance, therefore we, we, we understand and can connect really well when mm. we understand the etymology and the morphology of the words that we're, we're looking at. Right, so okay. if I know that T-I-O-N is usually shun, then I'm, I'm fine every time I see that. But yes. when you suddenly come to irregular um, phonologies, irregular spellings, um, which you get in, maybe, let's say, Cornish town names or something, <laughs> yeah. the irregular spellings, um, they become really difficult. And I find it myself, I work in intercultural dyslexia and international dyslexia. Mm. I'm always very sensitive to, to the potential to put me over as, as culturally insensitive when I, I, I read out foreign names. Particular yes. songs from Africa, which have generally got sort of, um, well, the countries that I've worked with, vowel consonant, vowel consonant, sort of fairly standard sort of vowel consonants of arrangements, but in, in ways and pronunciations I'm not used to. And I yes. find them extremely difficult to pronounce or to read. And even those that I know, I still have to go through them phony by phony, slowly, like, like I'm counting them out. Yeah. And that's, that's a little bit, uncomfortable because it, it it comes across as culturally insensitive and it's not supposed to no I, I can see i can see what you mean and it's that's tricky isn't it i suppose in the environment you're probably teaching in it's they're aware that you are neurodiverse but in a that kind of helps things go along but it's tricky isn't it coming up with i like i've had previous guests on where i'm there on google playing the name three or four times <laughs> I mean, you, like because you know it's important to them to get their name yeah. right. It's important to me that I get their name right. And it's, yeah. it's very, try to be respectful. And it's like, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, and stumbling I'm over it, you know? <laughs> but yeah, because what did Tricky at 30 years old to get a dyslexia assessment? Well, I was really lucky that I did terribly at school. I mean, in tremendous <laughs> ways, I, I wasn't. I, I had a horrible time at school. <laughs> I, I was the bottom of the class at almost everything. But what I mean is that I didn't, get to university until I was in my 20s. I was oh, yeah. coming at 23 when I, when I entered university. Yeah. And I spent about seven years doing my bachelor's and then my master's. That's quite a long time, but the bachelor's was a four-year course. And because, because of this, my reading speed, basically, um, I took a part-time master's and it took me three years. So that was seven years. My master's can take you a year, but do it part-time and you got slow reading speed. Yes. Three yeah. years. Now, fortunately, because I went to university late, um, I got to choose the university I wanted to go to in many respects um, because I took one extra A level and then right. did lots of interviews at universities to find out whether they'd accept me or whether they wouldn't accept me. And because yeah. I was a mature student, a lot of universities said, well, if you get a, a C or even a D, then we'll accept you. And, and, and so I chose to go to this amazing place in the the middle of Wales, called St. David's University College Lampton. Okay. <laughs> no one's ever heard, except people who've been there. Um, <laughs> I think he's changing his name. So it used to be St. David's University in Lampton, and then, um, then University of Wales Lampton, and now it's something like Trinity St. David's, and no one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing place. But it didn't have any bowling alleys, didn't have any any clubs, it didn't have any, you know, it didn't have any but it didn't have the kind of things that, that normal students want. Just for you as a twenty three year old, like where's exactly. the bowling alley and the clubs? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it was populated by weirdos. Who yeah, want okay. to go <laughs> <laughs> and and people who who people who failed their, their A levels and who got there on, on clearing. Fortunately, yeah. there was a massive overlap between the weirdos and the people who got to university on clearing. And because of <laughs> that, they had a very, they knew that they had a lot of intelligent students who couldn't pass exams. So they ah, had a lot of dyslexia unit. Right. Yes. And it wasn't sense. until I was handing in my master's degree, having 
struggled through things like slow reading speed, the inability to join in with other postgraduate activities, um, the inability to publish or to do extra work because I just had too much and just didn't have enough time. And my friends kept saying, mate, you're probably dyslexic, get yourself tested. It was only because of that that I got myself tested. Oh, I see. So I actually said it was your peers rather than a sort of professor or mentor. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was my dyslexic friends who insisted that I was as dyslexic as, as they were. You <sighs> were I, was, I was insisting to them that they were no more dyslexic than I was. <laughs> I knew mean, nothing about dyslexia, and I just uh, thought, you know, yeah, and literacy and words were bigger on the pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you meet my norm, so therefore, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. therefore you're normal. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not the fact that you spent nights grinding this master's degree out quite yeah. late and yeah, well. you, you know you've got dr martin in your uh in yeah. your linkedin profile so you clearly went on and got a phd after all that i did yeah i mean partly because i couldn't uh, for a lot of people if you discover you can do academia and and when you're at school you can't because it, it's horrible the way they demand that you work at yes. school is yeah. almost always alienating to those of us with dyslexia and, and other neurodivergent conditions. Yeah, but once yeah. you get past that and you get to university and find that there are things that you're able to do. So for me, the way that I worked in, in philosophy is, was, was very discursive. It was always discussion and argument and, and, okay. and, 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 and yeah, exploration. And it wasn't, it wasn't lots of note taking and, and lectures. I never did that. Uh, um, okay. So once you discover that you can do it, then there's something inside a lot of people that says, I need to prove myself. I'd ha I've had, I, I had the best part of my, of my ch childhood and youth being told I was stupid and mm -hmm. having that proven by the grades. Mm -hmm. Now I need to reassure myself that that's not true. And there's, there's this desire, this burning obsession to get to that, the top of that particular tree that you'd always told you had no chance of climbing. Yes, yes, I can see that. So, also by that point, you knew dyslexic. So, did you start employing different strategies then compared to what you did in your before dyslexia kind of days? 100%. Yes. Yeah. I mean, all of my plans, all of my, um, I told them essay plans. They were, let's say, in my, in my, um, my thesis plan it was essentially it was a, it was a visualized mind map. Mm. That's how I think. I think in, not in mind maps, but in cascade diagrams. So you have an idea, and then so I I, I describe a cascade diagram. I I often call it a champagne bag. So okay. you can imagine lots of champagne glasses and on 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 a table, and then a stack of other champagne glasses, and on top of them, and then on top of them more champagne glasses, yes, forming yes. a pyramid. And yeah, you pour champagne in, and the champagne falls down. Yeah, that's kind of what a, a cascade diagram looks like. So you've got one idea at the top, and it splits into two, and each of these ideas split into two, and each of those ideas split into two, and and that's what my thesis plan looked like, um, because that's how I think, and I I see that visually when when in conversation with people. So I'll often be able to 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 park a particular idea, go down go down separate track, then come back to the first idea, and then go back again. So I see it almost like a, a series of pathways. Okay, that's really interesting. Do you prefer it to my maps because it's more like you think, or is there another sort of deeper reason why? Yeah, there are two reasons I prefer to my maps. First reason is that it's how I think, and the second is that it seems to be more structured. Mind maps can be very difficult to follow. So yes. for me, and so champagne diagrams, cascade diagrams are, are a lot easier to follow, and they're more. They're more bounded, so they don't go off in all sorts of different directions. You can keep them fairly narrow in terms of what you what you want to talk about, what you want to, to discuss. Yes. Oh, that makes sense. I, I, I kind of like the idea of that, actually. You sort of see it in my head, really, and I always think my yeah. maps kind of... I think I got jaded. I saw spider diagrams first when I was at school, and it jaded me to that idea, but yes. actually my maps are a completely different thing. Um, but actually having it at the top and just dropping it all down and what all the wild ideas as it gets as the pyramid gets wider <laughs> at the bottom. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you can start knocking them off or going back up and down yeah. and stuff. Yeah. I, I plan lectures exactly the same way. I plan right. things I do. I'm thinking of writing a book at the moment and I planned it exactly that same way. So uh -huh. this is this is how I think and it's how I plan things. And it seems to it seems to work because it's yeah. 
fairly rigorous. It keeps to a general pattern. And you can you can show connections between the ideas quite easily. Yeah. Is the book going to be called The Champagne Solution? <laughs> it is now. <laughs> just, just to say. Yeah. Yeah. And then a big disclaimer of what it's actually about on the front cover. <laughs> 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 Copyright Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, obviously, that changed everything when you did your, your, your doctorate. Yeah. Now, I always like to ask people who've been statement with dyslexia later on in life and you were rolling on to 30. So, you hadn't really spent that long out of education. If you, you went back to uni at 23. you sort of done a little bit of travelling or something post A-levels before you hit university and then back in? So, what I yeah, what I'd done is I, I, I finished... I've been held back in school twice. Um, oh, okay. Once was when I was about eight, and once was when I was about 16, mm. um, just so I could get some O levels. Yeah, it was O levels in those days, and I had oh, to yes. on my O levels and then had to go back and do them again. Yeah. And I left school at 19, and I didn't go traveling. I just became irredeemably unemployed and unemployable. I couldn't get a job, and I couldn't hold a job down. Mm. partially because there'd always been this disconnect inside me. And a lot of dyslexics feel this, by the way, and from anecdotal evidence, there'd always been yeah. this disconnect between what I'd achieved or what I was capable of. Yes, yes. And so when you get employment with no qualifications whatsoever, the employment isn't terribly challenging. And it, it's not, you don't find it fits the value that you have. And I struggled with that. And I'd always struggled with authority anyway because <laughs> authority and being hyped them. No. So I kept getting sacked from, from jobs, uh, couldn't hold a job down. Oh, um, yes. Okay. It's really interesting, isn't it? Hold you back twice at school. I still didn't think there may be some real diversity going. Yeah, nobody, nobody suspected. Nobody suspected. But it, it sounds like, from what you're saying, it was pretty clear something was going on. Or they just think you were a problem. Um, I don't even think there were a pro that I don't even think they thought I was a problem. They just passed me by as a lost cause. Oh. Um, and, and often, and, and this is quite sad as a joke, um, the number of times that, that I would be the butt of a, a class joke given by the teacher because <sighs> they knew I couldn't do it. And so they'd have to laugh. And, and, um, yeah, and I went along with it because I suppose. At school, you take on a number of different roles. You take on one or two of, of the following roles. You can be the sporty one, you can be the intelligent one, you can be the bully, you can be the class clown, or you can be the, the victim. Uh, yes. And, yeah. and I was the class clown. And the class clown is often that person who accepts and, and I suppose, survives by either joking or being the butt of the joke. And when you're academically struggling you end up being the butt of the joke a lot of the time. And so, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and you don't realize what kind of effect it has on you. But people, yeah. are, people who, who I don't mean, I don't mean this in, a, in, a, in an arrogant way, but people who, who respect me, I don't mean to say you should respect me, but people who respect <laughs> me, still, at least God, no. but people who respect <laughs> me, are still, they'll still comment about how much I put myself down and take the mickey out of my own abilities in front of people uh, as though, as though I have no confidence to stand up and go, no, I'm capable of this. And this is because it's deeply ingrained from those formative years. Yes, yeah, yeah. You're, you're carrying the the strategy that worked really well for you in the formative years. You've carried on into adulthood, yeah. where it's probably not a great strategy anymore, but it's so yeah. hard to unlearn it. Yeah, yeah. And I think we all do that in various ways with different things, don't we? Just Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I always wonder what the class clown was doing hell from my sort of school, and yeah, I bumped into a couple of them. They're like, ah, <laughs> okay. On, on on the upside, um, I I formed on Facebook a group called La Societe Internationale du Martin Bloomfield, and I hunted <laughs> as many Martin Bloomfields as I could on Facebook and found the club. <laughs> and one of them is actually a professional clown. I mean, he's brilliant. I, I've met him. He's a lovely bloke. So. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's me from an alternative, but I, I, I don't know. Yeah, that sliding doors moment where, yeah. <laughs> that's really interesting. But yeah, how did you think of doing that on Facebook, like just this random society? 
<laughs> How many Martin Bloomfields are there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so we, we covered your doctorate. Um, you said mostly about your champagne diagrams or cascade diagrams. What other kind of tools do you start employing as a 30-something now knowing you're dyslexic? And were you at the same university for your doctorate as well, out of interest? No, no. Right. I went to the University of York for my doctorate. So oh, there, yes. were, there were basically there were three, three criteria I had for the university I went to. Um, yeah. uh, three criteria I, I'd like to have fulfilled. If I could have fulfilled two of those, that would be, that would be enough. Uh, one of them wouldn't be enough. And so these criteria were um, really high reputation, or oh, good reputation, yeah, okay. a good standard of university, um, an interesting university, and a local university. So reputation, interesting, and local. Now, there weren't many interesting local universities. So I could have gone to like Sorbonne, which would be interesting, but it wouldn't have been local. Right. Um, I could have gone for a good quality one, like Sorbonne, which wasn't local. Um, so, but it turns out that the University of York Okay, it wasn't an interesting one, but it was a good quality one and it was local. So oh, I went fine. to the University of York, had a, um, an interesting time <laughs> and a really interesting drawbacks that being dyslexic um, brought onto me. Okay. Um, but standards are uh, things that I, I did, things I'd always done. So taking notes, they were all, basically they were all color-coded. Co- color all yeah. of my notes are color-coded and, and often had little symbols next to them. So I could... If I draw three dimensional connections between the colors and the symbols, um, this is standard. I don't take that many notes. So when I was an undergraduate, I found that very quickly I realized I wasn't taking notes. I go to lectures if I went mm. to lectures. I go to lectures and come out with maybe one line of notes mm-hmm. or a couple of words of notes. So that kind of thing. The notes, I really crunched down the notes. And the, the notes that I did take were color coordinated. Um, and they were color coordinated in a number of ways. Red, blue, and black ink. Mm. Um, generally speaking, blue ink was what I used just to write down ideas and thoughts and the way that the argument was going. Right. Black ink would have been for quotations, uh, and red ink would have been, this is a danger point. So this is, this is an argument against what I want to do. And then um, I highlight them in different yeah. colors. So I highlighted yellow, highlighted blue, highlighted green, which gave a different kind of connection between ideas. And often there'd be like a triangle or a circle or a square next to them or a star or something. So okay. there are these connections between ideas. So I had those different dimensions of connections um, so that I could, I could essentially, even though the notes would be written on, um, on a, a piece of paper, I could still see that there were different ways they fitted together. Yeah. This is a paper of that makes sense. Yes, it does, yeah. The, the, the other thing which... I always found really important is I need to speak. I need to discuss. I need <laughs> yeah. to argue. And people would see me sitting in a, in a, I know, a study area or, or somewhere or in, in a library just talking to myself like a nutter and <laughs> arguing. And, and, and just, that's how I did it. If there was no one else there, then I'd have to do it on my own. So. You weren't doing the thing with your head where you took one way and the other way to, to swap characters. <laughs> half of that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shame, what's that? My face here. <laughs> yeah, so, so these things, really. But I mean, one of the other things I did, and it was why I had to get my second dyslexia diagnostic assessment. Uh, yes. In those days, they didn't transfer. So if you had a uh, for one place, it yeah. wouldn't work anywhere else. So you had to go and do it again. And of course, they cost a minimum of 400 pounds to 1,000 pounds. So it's yeah, yeah. really off for people. I mean, it's yeah. basically, it's a month's rent for most people. It's prohibitively expensive, isn't it? Really expensive, yeah. yeah. But if you're a student, you, you know, you're given a loan, and so that loan pays for it, and then you 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 gradually pay off the loan at, a, at, a, at an easy rate. And then, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't it wasn't a great way of doing it. At least it was manageable. Um, and that was so that they could take it seriously, um, which would allow me to 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 argue that that this is how I needed to write a paper. I needed to put spaces between the paragraphs rather than run the paragraphs together. I, need to, uh, I needed to, to use these fonts because these fonts really helped me. Not necessarily because they're dyslexia friendly. They were. I don't. I'm not. I'm not comfortable with a lot of the so-called dyslexia friendly fonts. But, but 
certain certain fonts just read easier, I guess. The spacing between the letters and the, that kind of thing. Because there are certain norms that you're expected to, con- to conform by and you don't want to. Other thing is my supervisor and I would have long conversations about the issues that I had. Um, the big issue that I always had throughout university, uh, this is one of the reasons why I was advised to get myself tested, is, is my, my papers could sometimes come out as unstructured. Um, perhaps the even stream of consciousness sometimes are all over the place. And, um, and, and I'd have to have long conversations with my supervisor over how to, we said, keep, keep the train on the rails. Yes. Uh, and, and that was, and, and for a while it was difficult. For a while it was very difficult. It, it looked like I might not have succeeded, in fact, because I was having so much trouble keeping the train on the rails. Um, that once I'd formulated how to do it, and essentially, it was, it, it was very simple stuff. I won't go into it, but mm. I know when I, I work with young students, they could be undergraduates or be master's students. Depending on their, their discipline, I will show them how to do it because very few people are given training in these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that kind of thing. So I've been talking with super, my supervisor about how to keep the train on the rails, um, arguing for particular kinds of of layouts when I when I read a paper, note taking, how many notes I take, how few notes I take, the way that I arrange the notes, uh, and, and just this this need to discuss. And I found that um, skim reading texts until I came across something which looked like it hooked my imagination, and then focusing on that. Was, yes. was so much more important than trying to digest an entire book or an entire article because that was hard. That was yeah, hard. yeah. I used to find when I was at uni, um, like yourself, I went as a mature student, but I would actually end up watching small YouTube documentaries and all that kind of stuff just yes. to get the high level. What does this all mean? And I can dive into specifics. And obviously, checking the actual text that the documentary isn't talking rubbish either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but and thank God for thank God for the YouTube. And also, I mean, let's be honest. When I mean, you go on to academia.eu or, or whichever of the academic sites you go on to, you find a paper, and then there's the control F search function. Yes, That's really useful. Oh God, yeah, 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 yeah. It's nothing worse than trying to skim. Masses of text to try. Yeah, out. yeah. And for people these for people these days, there are artificial intelligence academic search engines, mm. which if you type in certain keywords, they will tell you the academic papers you need to go looking for, and they'll link you to them. These are really useful. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's, they came into operation after I'd finished, but they would have been phenomenal for me. I mean, I still do research, so they are yes. useful. But if I'd been a student, they would have it would have transformed the way that I did research. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's where the technology really helps, isn't it? That kind of stuff. And yeah. yeah. Know, it, I remember diving on Google Scholar, but I imagine that's completely different to what it what used to be and far uh, more intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, by the way, just to, just to go back to something I mentioned earlier, um, back, I took champagne down Yeah, yeah. I saw it back down the other leg. But, right, yeah. Um, one of the big problems with being a, a PhD student is, is you might want to enter academia. A lot of us do um, because... You know, once you've gone down that track, there's very little else for you. <laughs> and, and you might want to go down that academic line. And the, the problem with academia is there are essentially two ways of getting an academic job. And there yeah. are only two ways of getting an academic job. And right. it's got nothing to do with how rich you are. It's got nothing to do, to do with how much you know of the subject, nothing to do with how intelligent you are, nothing to do with how good a communicator you are or how well you're able to let your students. There are two ways, two, two means of getting a job in academia. You either know people who can give you a helping hand, mm. or you're published. Those are the two ways. Both of them, perfect. But it's usually one, one or both of those two. Those are the ways of getting an academic job. If you're dyslexic and you're trying to work and you're doing a jo- your doctorate at the same time, there is no way you can publish. It's yeah. not hard because the amount of extra research Extra writing, extra organization, extra editing you, you have to do. It's just, it's, it's insane. And so you find yourself hindered in the ability to 
to do the extra things that, um, that everybody else would be doing. Yes, because you're spending more time on doing the things to hit the minimum standard, I guess. You, you're, yeah. putting, you're investing more resources in it, therefore there isn't the capacity to dive into other things. Now that is the money. Didn't realise academia was quite like that with terms of getting into it, into it. So, how did you manage to get into it in the end? Out of curiosity, I, I know people. Ah, I took that route. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That. And, and and I mean, it's not that. It's not that. It's an unfair advantage. No, no, no one who works in academia will will give you a recommendation or or give you a helping hand unless. Unless they think it's worthwhile, because they're not going to ruin their own reputation so for other someone just because they like you as a mate. You know, that's that's yes. not yes. Yes. Yeah. But it is a matter of, of luck of, uh, and good fortune of whether you whether you happen to move in the circles of people who uh, uh, of people who, who um, can possibly give you a helping hand. One of the things that I, I teach, interestingly, um, for your associates is mm. his academic writing. Mm. Um, and we work with a lot of overseas academics because they want to get published in English. And there are norms, there are there are uh, there are models and frameworks that we use. There are standards that they don't use in, say, let's say, Germany or France. And if they want to get published in English, they they have to know about the the norms and the the the, the, the ways that we do it in English. And so I'll I'll basically give training in this. And because of that, I've met a number of academics who. who who enjoy discussing things with me and, and say, oh, maybe we could have a discussion about dot, dot, dot. And that's basically how I've done it. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yes. So they... and, and I feel like a complete fraud when I say that, but <laughs> most people in academia would, if, if they have to, they'll admit it. That there are, those are the ways you get into academia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how do you find lecturing now? Because you were saying about using your, your diagram and stuff, but you've sort of gone from maybe struggling at university particularly before your dyslexia diagnosis, to now being stood in front of a class of students and doing things like that. Um, I guess being high energy presenting style helps. <laughs> but how are you finding being the uh, gamekeeper now? I, I love it. So I've, I've, I've been a trainer for much of my adult life. So right. I, I, okay. I, I, I enjoy it and, I, and I, I, I'd like to think you're quite good at it. <laughs> also, I mean, one of the things is that something that comes very naturally to me is that I'm a very visual person. Yes. And I explain concepts very visually. Um, and I, I'm also a very interactive person. And so I what, I, what I'll never do is stand in front of a lecture hall with, with just tons of texts or reading stuff for people. Everything is explained either visually or through gamification uh, or interactivity. That's that's just the way I do it. Part of yeah. I don't want to get bored. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know that they don't want to get bored either, but it's 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 all built on good didactic principles. Yeah, it yeah. also means that I am very much aware that there is not only one way of grading a piece of work. So if somebody wants ah, to, okay. if somebody wants to show me that they understand such and such a concept in, let's say, digital ethics or ethics and artificial intelligence or ethics and culture or neurodiversity, if they want to show me that they know. Uh, that they've understood a particular idea that we've discussed, they can show me in almost any way they want, as long as I feel that I can grade it. So if they want to write an essay, they can write an essay. If they want to create a mind map with explanations of what's on the mind map, they can do that. If they want to record themselves speaking into a, into a, a camera, they can do that. If they want to get together with, with, with their colleagues um, and they want to have a debate in front of me, they can do that. They can do almost whatever they want if they think that's going to demonstrate that they have the sufficient depth of knowledge. Yeah. And it's crucial to me that, that the ability to show that you understand isn't confined to the traditional essay format. Yes. Yeah. I, and the traditional exam format as well. I mean, if you asked me to, to do an exam on, uh, on my, my thesis, I might not pass. You know, exams are things I always failed. But when you, when you go through the thesis, what you have is you have something called the, the, the vibro, the viva. It's essentially the oral defense. 
when what you do is you discuss your thesis and the ideas in your thesis with a panel of lecturers who slowly try chipping away at the thesis. And, 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 and the more they do that, the more they know that you understand the thesis. And, 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 and this is a great way of showing that somebody has a depth of knowledge and understanding. Somebody has a deep understanding. Rather than simply can they go through the motions of answering certain set questions. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, sometimes? Because exam technique is a, should we say, a different skill set altogether. Completed. That yeah. some people really, really struggle with. And I know other people who are the polar opposite, like you're like, they ain't going to pass this exam ever. But, and they do an all-nighter and somehow pass it. And you're like, how? Yeah. How is that even possible? You know? <laughs> I have some of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can, 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 you, can you show me the way? Although yeah. I don't know if I can drink that much Red Bull anymore, but... <laughs> <laughs> I've well, not tried. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember just the can of Monster Energies while writing my yeah. dissertation. Yeah. And then feeling rather ill afterwards. <laughs> he's got <laughs> these tablets like called Pro Plus. I don't yes. know. Yes. Caffeine before. pills. Yeah. That was, that was the old school solution before the um, <laughs> marketing got hold of you with the energy companies. <laughs> <laughs> Where I'd like to shift the conversation to is your kind of dyslexia support teaching and your, your international intercultural perspective. This is sort of. Sounds really fascinating and um, not quite sure where to start. So I think international would be interesting first. You've kind of hinted on some of the international stuff with some of the things we come up in conversation, but what kind of got you interested in that? And can you sort of summarise it for people yeah, as well? It, I suppose there's a number of things that got me interested in. They all come together. It's very, you have to forgive me. Very few things I can give a purely linear answer to because that's, that's just fine. Yeah. And one of the things is that I work in an intercultural and international environment. And so yeah. I generally have that perspective anyway. And another of the, another of the, the, the influences is that I'm very aware of what you might call forms of cultural imperialism. Uh, and I've worked in forms of cultural imperialism as well. Um, now, Cultural imperialism can take many forms, but one of the forms it can take is to say, look, this is our understanding of something. Our understanding of it comes from a particular cultural perspective. This is therefore what it is. And then you, you, you export that to cultures that don't share that perspective. And you've done something, let's, let's say you've done something inappropriate. Um, it might be morally unpleasant or it might not be, but it's, it's inappropriate to assume that something that's that's viewed from a particular cultural perspective works in all cultural perspectives. One of the things, uh, this one of the things that came from the thesis is, is that um, whenever we, we, we give an account of most things, we're giving an account of it from our own aim, aims and purposes. And every culture has implicit aims and purposes. Yeah. Without necessarily having explored them. And that's the danger. And so where one culture has an aim and a purpose that, that doesn't fit the aims and the purposes of another culture, then you find that there may be inappropriate sort of imposition of an idea. Most of the, uh, most of the work and what you would call the, um, the, validate, the validated work around dyslexia and what dyslexia is comes from Let's say SASC, there's currently engaged in the project of a new definition of dyslexia. Um, the British Dyslexia Association, and, um, the American Dyslexia Association, International Dyslexia Association, possibly the European Dyslexia Association. These are all very Eurocentric organizations. Yes. All of them. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, if you then go to, let's say, Sub Saharan Africa, or you go to Ghana and you ask them what dyslexia is, they will take these exact same definitions. Or the opposite, if you go to somebody who's got one of these, who, who've got their own definitions, our immediate reaction is usually one of horror. Because you think, how on earth can you describe dyslexia in those ways? Because it feels inappropriate to us. And so one of the things we have to do is we have to be able to almost step out of the I hate this word, forgive me for using it, step out of the silos we all live, we all have because yeah. uh, it's a horrible word, but I, I, yeah. I couldn't help it. Um, yeah. Because usually when I understand something, I understand it from my perspective because I, I know why, where I'm coming from. I don't mm. necessarily understand it from somebody else's perspective. So to properly and fully understand it, 
I want to try to step into somebody else's skin uh, as much as I can. This is one of the reasons that um, I, I, I initiated a project a few years ago, and we're hoping to extend it. It's called the okay. Dyslexia Compass. Right. And the Dyslexia Compass noted that there are different measurements of how many people are dyslexic around you. And mm. one of the questions was why? Um, now, it became very clear that what we didn't want to do was impose a, uh, a set of measurement criteria to fit everybody. Yes, what we yeah. needed to do is find some way that you can use to translate between the different measurement criteria that's appropriate to your own cultural setting. And yes. this, this is one of the reasons that understanding dyslexia from a cultural perspective is so important. You have a number of different people um, migrating to the country uh, if the government allows them to. And they, they usually come from uh, often very different cultures. It's possible that these people can lose their dyslexia diagnosis because they understand dyslexia differently. Uh, and the dyslexia diagnosis they're given in one country doesn't fit the criteria for dyslexia in another country. And um, we have had, yeah. I've had, anecdote after anecdote after anecdote, people saying, yeah, I lost my diagnosis, or this person I know lost her diagnosis. And we get this over and over again. And so if we don't understand dyslexia from this sort of this, this broader perspective, then we're going to, we're going to continue essentially tearing dyslexia diagnoses away from people because their cultural understanding doesn't fit our cultural understanding. Yeah, that's fascinating. And yeah, so you're almost rather than, yeah, you don't want to tweak their cultural understanding to yours, but you need like a hmm, science word. A conversion factor between the two, don't you? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We need some way of being able to to translate or align or, or convert, as you say. To yeah. Be able to see it from both sides. Yeah. So out of curiosity, I don't know if you've got any specific examples in mind, uh, just to sort of colour it a bit more with another kind of culture's definition of dyslexia, oh. what that kind of looks like. Yeah, how, yeah. How's that different from our sort of, you know, we're both British and, for certain age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I can give you a, a ton of different examples. So um, I think it's the King Salman um, Center for Disability Research in Saudi Arabia talks about dyslexia as incompetences. Um, oh, we, okay. we look at uh, the Japanese Dyslexia Association, which uses the word guy, which translates as impediment or impairment. Um, okay. You look at, for instance, the British Dyslexia Association, which actually tries to focus on it as a difference. Yes. Uh, you, you look at, for instance, Made by Dyslexia, which goes on a more positive route and starts talking about positive spikes and that kind of thing. You go towards the American Dyslexia Association and they talk about it as gene conditional assessments about defective sensory processing. Uh, and this, and, and every, well, <laughs> every, I know every single um, definition of dyslexia, uh, let's say official definition of dyslexia, contains at least three and often four parts. It contains what you might call an origin part. And so this will be, for instance, it is um, inherited or it's acquired or it, it's developmental. Then you'll, you'll have what you might call the, the genetic part, and it will be gene based or neurological or biological. Then you will have the effect of the dyslexia. So they'll talk about phonological processing or, or information processing or, or, or reading or something like that. And then they'll have the value and there'll be difference or impediment or, or, uh, or I heard the word disturbance or disability. And these four columns, if you like, they're almost, they're, they're not interchangeable. Like you could almost look at them like, um, you know, like playing a fruit machine and they spin around and, and, and depending on, where whether you've got like a, a, a I don't know an inherited um, neurological phonological disability or a um, or a developmental biological reading difference. These are different definitions of what dyslexia. Are. They might not be absolutely incompatible, but they're not the same. And where they're not the same, people look at them and they test for them differently. And that's really interesting because if you've got one definition, you'll test for that definition. If you've got another definition, you'll test for that definition. Yes, of course. Yeah. I don't know what I was kind of leading to, but you've already covered it really, is that it's something going on in the human brain and the human brain starts the same until we build culture and stuff onto it. 
And I know two dyslexics aren't the same, and you and I are very different. And should I, I've spoken to these 60 dyslexic people, and we're all very, very different. But you're right, it's the testing, isn't it? The specific things that are tested for are what catches that out. So you can put your hand up and come from, as you said, Saudi Arabia, or whatever. You know, this says I'm dyslexic, and then you test it in the UK, for example, and they look for something different. Like, well, it seems like, you know, this doesn't lie up, tie up with what your initial diagnosis is. But they actually, underneath it all, they're still the same person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and as well as testing for different beats, um, you'll find that, let's say, I'm going to use this phrase, key assessment criteria. This is yes. a phrase that we came up with in the Dyslexia Compass Project. Okay. Key assessment criteria are the, the key things you're assessing for with dyslexia. So it could be, for instance, phoneme blending, or it could be reading speed, or it could be working memory, or it could be whatever whatever we, we want to, to, to put into these, these, these criteria. Well, different diagnosticians around the world not only test for different things, not only use different tools to test for these things, not only have different standards of, let's say, standard deviation of what counts as, as dyslexic and what doesn't count as dyslexic, but they prioritize them different. So, for instance, in Croatia, they mm. generally put working memory as the highest thing they're looking for. Whereas in Britain, we put phonological processing as the highest thing we're looking for. Yeah. yeah. Now, this is, this is really interesting because even if the Croatians and the British are looking for the same things, if they're prioritizing those things differently, they're not looking for dyslexia in the same way. Yes. Yeah, that's really interesting. And why do you think Croatia have decided to prioritize things differently to us Brits? Well, one of the things it could be is what they call orthographic depth. Now, right. I'm going okay. to explain that really quickly to people who, who aren't familiar with the term orthographic depth. Um, and by the way, then I'm going to say, I'm not sure it is that, but... <laughs> but, but <laughs> Spoiler! <the obvious>, right? <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to confuse everyone and then say and forget what I just said. <laughs> um, orthographic depth. Essentially, orthography is, is... English is very orthographically deep and Finnish or Welsh is orthographically shallow. Or you could say English is orthographically opaque and Finnish and Welsh are orthographically transparent. And what right. it means is when you look at a letter in Finnish, it's obvious what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So let's take Welsh, for instance. I, I speak a very small amount of Welsh uh, from, <laughs> from the time I lived in Wales. If you see the, the two L's next to each other in Welsh, you know every single time it's a sound. Right, okay. It doesn't matter where... where what, what word they're, they're, they're in, when they're on their own, whether they're in a long word, whether at the beginning, at the end, or whether they're followed by an O or a Y, they're going to sound like, that's it. And if you see O-U-G-H in English, you have no idea what it's going to sound like. It could yeah. be O, Ow, Uf, Uf, or it could be anything like that. Even down to, if you see the word, if you see a single letter, such as G, in English, it could be a G, it could be a J, it could even be a... It might even be silent. It might even be silent, like not. You, know? <laughs> you have no idea what it's going to sound like. And that makes English what they call orthographically deep or orthographically opaque. Whereas Welsh, where you always know what the letters sound like, is orthographically transparent or shallow. So one of the reasons they might use different things or, or they might prioritize different things in certain countries is that some countries may have different orthographies. So in, in Croatia, it may be that they're more orthographically transparent than we are in English. It turns out that's not really why, why they, they do it, but it's one of the things we investigated to find out whether it was. Um, it, it's simply that that's how things have developed. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's really interesting because that means it's an accident, essentially. Yeah, it's organic. Or, or at the very least, it's contingent upon cultural forces that have not necessarily got anything to do with dyslexia. Yes, yeah, yeah. it's kind of an organic way of yeah. work, working it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, it's, it's, it's also partly to do with the, the, um, the tests that they use. So if the tests that they use focus on these things rather than those things, then of course they're going to prioritize them. If the tests focus on working memory slightly more than they focus on, I don't know, let's say um, sequencing, then they're going to then they're going to test the working memory more than they're going to test the sequencing. Yes, yeah. There's a bias to always one way or the other with the testing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's really interesting. 
Do you find, we've obviously talked about orthographics, but... <laughs> Sorry if that was a bit dull. No, 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 that's really interesting. Um, and sort of the orthographic debt, but because I kind of had a language question in my head, and it's really interesting to talk about language, but like, do you find languages that use a different alphabet to the sort of standard letters we've got, do you find they are very different in terms of how they define dyslexia and test for it? So I went to a really interesting online lecture recently. Um, and it, it, it's given me pause for thought. All the research that I'd seen, not done, but all the research that I'd seen prior to this, had said that if you read, let's say, logographic or, or logosyllabic alphabets, such as Chinese, essentially where, where you're not looking at letters, you're looking at pictograms, you're looking at pictures, or, 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 or let's say um, hieroglyphics from ancient Egypt. If, if, you, if you read a language that's written using this kind of script, then actually your brain, the, the part of the brain that's triggered is essentially a visual part of the brain, not the phonological part of the brain. And therefore, you're not going to pick up on slow phonological processing speed because you're not processing phonologically anyway. Now, this can have very detrimental effects um, because dyslexia is more than phonological processing deficit. Some dyslexia doesn't involve phonological processing deficit, but dyslexia is certainly more than phonological processing deficit. Uh, and people with dyslexia will still suffer at school, even though they read at the same speed as other people read, because they don't think in the same way that other people think. And, and we can show this very, very, we can show this very simple that, that if the brain is a physical entity, and it is, and we talk about the neural pathways within the brain, they are also physical entities. So you have, for instance, the ventral pathway, which is somewhere over there. Um, the ventral, the, 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 the neural pathways are part of the physical brain. Now, we know that the dyslexic brain is physically built slightly different from the non dyslexic brain. And therefore, the neural pathways will be slightly different. So they're pointing in slightly different ways. In other words, you're processing information slightly differently. Or to put it in more vernacular terms, you're thinking slightly differently. And so because of the, the, the way the brain is built, dyslexics think differently. And even if you don't have any trouble reading because of the, the, they've got rid of the phonological processing problem, you still may be got uh, challenges in school because of the way they traditionally teach, but they won't pick up on it as dyslexia. So in certain countries, such as Japan, they say, oh, there's no dyslexia. And of course, there's dyslexia. They just can't see it because of the alphabet. But I went to a lecture or, or a talk online recently where somebody was saying, no, 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 with, with, with as it were, logographic alphabets, or not alphabets, the logographic script, your brain's still doing more or less the same thing. And this shows something very interesting, which is that none of the research is settled. No. no. And, and, when, and, and I know it's very frustrating because people often ask, you know, what's the reason for this? What's the reason for that? Or what is dyslexia? And, and you ha you're either going to give a simple but sort of not terribly accurate answer. Or you're going to give an accurate answer that's really not simple at all. And you've mm. got to draw the, the, the you've got to find the balance between those. Yes. Yeah. I mean, science and research is always evolving, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Science. So the simple answer, I guess, is that different, different scripts, we can call them alphabets if you want, different scripts will have an effect on phonological process. We know that. Yeah. And I've, it's really interesting because I'd heard that before with like dyslexia maybe occurs less in countries that use scripts uh, rather than sort of letters like we do. And I thought, ah, it's really interesting, but I hadn't thought of it the other way. Actually, their brain is still wired slightly differently and they're getting picked up less because the really kind of, I don't know if it's low hanging fruit, but sort of effectively is, um, isn't there. So Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that there are fewer dyslexics. It's the, the way that we initially spot dyslexia isn't there. So if we're initially spotting dyslexia, looking at phonological processing deficits, and we're not putting phonological processing pressures on people, then we're not going to stop dyslexia. Mm. Yeah, it'd be interesting if they start learning a second language that is closer to the Greek alphabet. It's fascinating. The stuff out, out there yeah, on yeah. these second languages is, is, uh, is really <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yes, yeah. Imagine it is. Now, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so deep, isn't it? It's really interesting how, how stuff 
the same thing is seen around the world of what, mm. what priorities are. And Yeah. I mean, it's the classic elephant. I mean, we, we, we've yeah. all heard the story of the, the, the elephant in the room filled with blind people. Yeah. And, and one blind people feels a trunk and thinks, oh, I've, I've got a hose pipe. And another blind <laughs> person feels a leg and thinks, ah, yeah. an, an umbrella stand. And somebody feels a, tr- a tusk and thinks, ah, someone's got a saw. And, and everybody's feeding the elephant, someone's feeding the ear and going, ah, nice fan. Yeah. They're, they're all <laughs> describing a part of something that's bigger. Uh, and yeah, uh, depending on which angle you come from, we're all blind people feeling well at it. Yeah, we are. Because obviously you've done quite a bit of research on this. And what is the reception like from the people who defined kind of these things, like the B- BDA or the American Dyslexia Association or made by or whichever organisation we could pick out of lots of great organisations? Do they kind of hear some of this and think, hmm, do we need to look at this again? Or how how do you get the feel for that? It's about the culture. So I'm going to go back to culture and, and talk about yeah. company culture and organizational culture. I mean, if Fair you enough. have an organizational culture that is open and, li- and listens, then you're going to get very positive responses. Um, but then let's take the British Dyslexia Association. I, I know a couple of people who, who are quite big in the British Dyslexia Association. And they're really good. They're really open. They, they love listening. I, I've spoken to somebody else who's, who's equally big in the British Dyslexia Association who's quite um, focused, let's say, and quite quite less less flexible. And then when you see the, the different branches of the British Dyslexia Association, so for instance, the York branch and the London, the East London branch, the Nottingham branch, and the, the World Mountain branch, then it depends on who's in charge of that branch or who, who overrides that branch, depending on whether that branch is flexible or not. So... Um, there's an awful lot of, of organizational culture involved in, in answering that. Um, there is a, always a danger that different organizations want to be right mm-hmm. and where you produce a definition or an understanding that's being given from a different organization, there is an element of spikiness that the spikes come up and go, oh, no, 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 we prefer our definition. Yeah, and and what's really interesting is we... Um, uh, Atima and I looked at um, dyslexia diagnosticians around Europe and, and which definition they, they agreed with. And all the, the vast majority of British diagnosticians agreed with, of all the definitions we gave them, we gave them a big raft of definitions. Almost all the, uh, the British diagnosticians thought that the British Dyslexia Association definition was the best. Yeah. Um, of the <laughs> um, continental European um, diagnosticians, it was split 50-50 between the International Dyslexia Association, the European Dyslexia Association definitions. And so you find that depending on where we come from as, as yeah. researchers and diagnosticians, yeah. Yeah. definitions that we accept are going to be different as well. So of course it is, yeah. it's not only does, does SAS have one definition and, and uh, and are they going to be flexible? It's the definitions we accept. Are we going to be flexible about that? And then we're back to the, the aims and the purposes and the cultural, the cultural sort of influences. And, and yeah. 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 It is. And it's, yeah, I've seen that with all sorts of stuff where <laughs> even something as silly as British versus European chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to a German friend recently who was insisting that German chocolate is better than British chocolate. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, um, I'm not sure if it's the same now, but it used to be that um, we're, British chocolate has more vegetable fat than European chocolate does because the European chocolate doesn't allow it. So Cadbury's dairy milk, for example, is sold in both countries, but they taste different. And it's like blind test. The Brits are like, well, obviously this one's better because, you know, that goes with the tea. You know? <laughs> but it's... It's funny, isn't it? Because you just brought up the culture and you, even that blind testing with something as simple as that. But when you get to a complicated definition like what we're talking yeah. about dyslexia. Don't... And, and these are diagnosticians. And and these these diagnosticians, these are the people, and, and quite right, these are the people we trust, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. And where the people we trust have, I'm going to call them blind prejudices, but that makes them sound worse than I'd be. You know, where, where they have these 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 ingrained um, these ingrained positions that they don't realise they have. Yeah, so internal influence, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And depending on on where you where you live, I mean, we just talked about Europe. I mean, if you go to Africa, hmm. there are enough places in Africa, and I'm just going to mention one country, 
Um, I've spoken to a lot of people from Nigeria and okay. it has come up again and again and again that once you're outside the big cities, go into a village, the likelihood of dyslexia being looked upon as the product of witchcraft or a curse ah. is enormous. And oh, right, yes. in fact, if oh you God. have dyslexic children in certain areas, it's easier to murder your own children than have dyslexic children. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that, that's how big these cultural influences oh, are. Just, uh, not even get the shaman, shaman in, it's just... Yeah, yeah just, it's just, just off just of the head. Off of the... Jeez, wow. Yeah, wow. and there, there have been cases in Britain, by the way. There have been cases in Britain where the police have been called in because, because dyslexic and other neurodivergent kids have been either murdered or tortured or just locked up in cells or cellars, sorry, because uh, of the, the, if you like, of the local cultures of the people who, who yeah. whose kids they are. Yes. Uh, and, you know, that, that's, it's tragic when you see that. It is. And, and, you know, well done for bringing up a more local to home thing after the kind of the shock with Nigeria. That actually, you know, it's closer to us than we think sometimes. It's an hour and dust. Yeah. 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 Wow. Misinformation is a scary thing sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, on a very, on a sort of less terrifying. When I was at school in the 1970s, when I was at primary school in the 1970s. Yeah. Uh, I, in your flares. In my flares, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were calling your own flares. Oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Brown card of old flares. But I was in a basic show, massive car. But this is a primary school in the 1940s. I mean, no one knew that I was dyslexic. No one suspected that I was dyslexic, as, you, as, as you, you've already touched on. But what there was, and I thank goodness I didn't go here, but what there was was um, something called the remedial class. Ah, uh, yes. yes. Now, the remedial class was full of the dyslexic, autistic, ADHD kids, but it was also full of maybe people with more complex learning difficulties. Um, it was full of... It had been made with fetal alcohol syndrome. It had whoever whoever was in there. The rest of us did not. We, not only we didn't mix with them, we didn't go near them because you might catch something. And and this idea of the remedial and we were what six years old, seven years old. How would we know? But the idea of the, the, the remedial class as being this terrifying thing, well, we looked at them almost as as sort of uh, medieval lepers. Yeah, uh, th this was happening in Britain. Thirty, well, it's not. It's nineteen seventy. It oh, you being Morris. generous now. <laughs> <laughs> However long it is, <laughs> but yeah, it was happening within within our generation, anyway. and it may still be happening in certain areas. I have no idea. I haven't heard of it, but it may still be happening. We just well, don't. Hopefully not. Hopefully things are <laughs> moved on a lot since then. I mean, you know, yeah. I'd, Bit, bit younger than you, so it was 80s and 90s for me where we yeah. were taking to extra lessons in a smaller room, but it was never this kind of remedial class thing. But yeah, 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 um, God, yeah, just scary. And, and I, I was, I, I know this, this, this girl, um, I've known her since she was about five. Mm -hmm. Um, she was a lovely girl, but she's also lovely now, by the way. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> she hasn't grown into something else, she right? Into a monster, or anything. <laughs> <laughs> And and she's dyslexic, and and you know I, I was talking to a mum from from well from when she was five. I was talking to a mum about um, dyslexia, and I gave her a little sort of unofficial assessment and said, "Look, it's clearly dyslexia. Yeah, and, you know, maybe you want to get a properly assessed." And and and, uh, and she went to to all sorts of different schools. She went to a Steiner school. She went to a Montessori school. She 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 was in home tuition. All sorts of things. She's a very intelligent girl. Um, she was a very intelligent girl. Now she's a very intelligent woman. Yes. And yes. Uh, um, she wanted to become a doctor. Okay, yeah. And there was a university she really wanted to go to in Malta. Oh, okay. And um, she was at school. And in her school, they gave her extra tuition to get through the, the subjects that were necessary for her. So maths and, and, and biology. Right. Yes. They gave her extra yeah. tuition. In order to give her extra tuition, they had to remove other lessons from her. So they, they removed languages because you know, French, you need French. Um, so, you know, I, mean, I say that in a rather flippant way, but I mean, she didn't yeah. need French for her, for her yeah. medical degree. No, so no, they, no. Gave her, um, they gave her extra maths and, and biology tuition 
in place of her languages. Languages. The Maltese University refused to accept it because one of the entrance criteria was that you have to have a language. Oh. Even though they said, look, she's got a dyslexia diagnosis. This is why she, 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 she left life. And then Maltese schools said, irrelevant. It doesn't matter that she's got a dyslexia diagnosis. These is the rules. And, yeah. and so even within European countries, the, the, the differences in, in what you need to, the hoops you need to jump through. Yeah. And, and it's not only the hoops you need to jump through, it's the reasons behind these hoops. Yes. So in Britain, there is a lot of understanding. We're, we're quite lucky. Yes, so in, we are. In yeah. other countries, there's less understanding. There's less forgiveness, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we are. And I think, you know, BDA has been around for a long, long time. And I think it's one of the oldest organisations mm. that advocates this lecture. And I think yeah. we benefit in Britain from their presence being around for as long as it has been. Very much, yeah. Very much, yeah. I mean, you look at the history of dyslexia and a lot of it, not all of it, a lot of it, a lot of the, the, the steps forward have come from, from Britain. I don't mean to be nationalistic when I say that, but it, it, it does mean that we can understand a little bit why we've got a slightly more, um, a slightly more inclusive view of dyslexia than, than some other places. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know. Yeah. But it gives you hope that they're just on a different journey. And they'll, they'll, they'll find inclusivity and flexibility. Yeah. And, you know, see, see the trail that's started to be blazed and be inspired by it and make their own, hopefully, yeah. and things yeah. like that. So, yeah. yeah, definitely. Right. I'm going to start winding the podcast up at this point. Now, every guest that comes on the show gets three rapid fire questions from me. Oh, 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 you, you didn't show, show me what things are going to be beforehand. <laughs> I, I, do not tell anybody what they're going to be beforehand. <laughs> so, they don't need rapid-fire answers from you, by the way, but they are quick questions from me. So let's dive into question number one. What prejudice have you had about dyslexia that's been proven wrong? Um, well, clearly that um, dyslexics see words moving around on the page. That's, that's been proven wrong. Yeah. Um, also, that it, you know, we're, we're, as it were, intellectually normal. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, that's, uh, <laughs> it still surprised me some people think that. <laughs> like, it's like, which, which decade are you from again? <laughs> well, I know, yeah. yeah. I mean, the number of people I've seen who, who basically said to me, I used to, be, I, I used to think I was just like, so it turns out I was just me. Yeah, yeah. Like, Thanks, mate. That's not yeah. funny. Yeah. yeah, that's not funny, really. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Oh, dear. Okay, question number two. If an alien landed and you had to describe dyslexia to them, how would you do it? Oh, I'd say it's a different way of understanding and processing information. Um, uh, and, and sometimes that means that there are challenges involved, but it also means that generally speaking, you tend to be a little bit more creative and you tend to be very good at understanding problems. But you'll, find, you'll generally find things like reading and writing difficult. Yes. Ah, nice succinct answer there. <laughs> I, I'd speak alien, by the way. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my Klingon isn't that great. <laughs> uh, uh, no. <laughs> You're choosing another race. You speak more to <laughs> alien or predator rather than yeah. Klingon, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, final rapid fire question. Seeing as this is called the Dyslexia Life Hack Show, what is your favorite dyslexia life hack? Oh, wow. My favorite dyslexia life hack um, is transparency. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. So, um, I find a lot of dyslexics are a little bit embarrassed or afraid to, to talk about the dyslexia. I find that generally speaking, when I'm transparent, when I'm open about my dyslexia, people really want to know and they're really understanding. And, and I've had business situations where, where I've thrived in business because I've been able to talk to people and, yeah. and say, look, this is what dyslexia is. And go, oh, right. Okay. I'm like this and I'm like this. And, and, mm. and, and so it opens up spaces where you're allowed to thrive. So my biggest life hack is be open about it. Yes. I second that one because I've discovered being open about it seems to help most areas of my life. To be honest, it's really surprising once you get over the stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Before we sign off, is there anything else you'd like to add? And would you like people to find you? If they do, where can they find you? I'd love people to find me if they'd like to. Yeah, um, you can generally find me on Instagram as Martin Bloomfield, or I was persuaded to add the doctor at the beginning. Um, <laughs> I did. And so I now really, really love it. 
So you yeah. can probably talk about them. <laughs> you, you can find me online as um, Dyslexia Bites. Yeah. So the website, which is currently undergoing a transformation, so it, it looks like a building site at the moment, right, is dyslexiabytes.org. And that's B-Y-T-E-S, the bytes. Dyslexiabytes, one word, dot org. You can also find me on um, YouTube as YouTube forward slash Dyslexia Bites. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, other than that, if you want to check out the Dyslexia Compass, by the way, I mentioned that. That's the yes. Dyslexia Compass, one word, Dyslexia Compass. Dot EU, and it'll show you how you can translate between various different understandings of dyslexia around Europe. It's fascinating stuff. Also, this isn't to advertise myself. This <laughs> isn't to advertise myself. Um, but if you find my website, dyslexiabytes.org, um, at the bottom of the website, it said, here's some other pages, here's some other websites we're, we're involved in. And one of them is called the Dyslexia Map. Yes. Now, this is a particular labor of love that I've been doing. Okay. Um, I've been creating a Google map where I'm trying to include, if I can, okay. every dyslexia-related school, support group, organization, diagnostician in the world. So wow. depending on where you are and you yeah. want to find a dyslexia organization, it should be there. Yeah. If you have a dyslexia organization or support group and you want to hook up and link up with somebody nearby, it'll be there as well. So go to the dyslexia map at the bottom of my website. Click on that and it, it'll have, at the moment, it's got some like five and a half thousand entries. It's a, an unending labor of love. Uh, and there's going to be more and more. Cool. Well, yes, definitely go check that out, especially if you know somebody near you. Put it on the map, though. That is it. A very interesting and cool resource because sometimes it's hard. And, you know, I've had people message me before, like, hey, you know, I think my son, daughter, whoever, who do you recommend? It's like, well, I, you know, I, I know previous podcast guests and, point them to the BDA and that's about as far yeah. as it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the dyslexia map grew. So recently on Facebook, I saw somebody saying, uh, my daughter is dyslexic and she's moving to Connecticut and she yeah. doesn't know Blimey. of any uh, of any help. Can you help me? And I says, here's the Connecticut Dyslexia Association. Here's the Connecticut sort of support group. And and I just said, look, go to the dyslexia map, find Connecticut, you'll see everywhere you want. Everyone oh, you wow. Want. Yeah, what a great resource. Oh, that is cool. Well, that just leaves me to thank you for taking the time to come on the show today. It's been really fascinating talking about the cultural stuff as well as your backstory too. Thank you. And that leaves me to thank everybody else for taking the time to listen and I'll speak to you in the next episode. Goodbye for now. <laughs>